thanks so much, everyone, for joining today. Uh, apologies for starting a few minutes late. We were having some uh, technical, <laughs> technical challenges on, on the back end that I think we've partly sorted out. <laughs> um, so welcome and thank you, everyone, for joining us for our new ideas series. My name is Aria Molino with IntelliCap, and I lead the SANCOP Forum in Africa and based out of Nairobi, Kenya. Um, Margaret, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. Just to give you some background, uh, Sankalp Forum is the largest convening for the impact investing and entrepreneurial community for and by the Global South. Um, we've hosted 21 editions across India, Kenya, and Indonesia in the last 10 years. And we recently launched these Sankalp Dialogues earlier this year to promote multiple touch points um, throughout the year for the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And today's discussion uh, will focus on designing an impact economy. So today we're really looking at, you know, as economies across the world have been navigating through this COVID-19 pandemic, we're not only seeing the staggering economic impact, but also severe socioeconomic impacts on unemployment, plunging investments, and fissures in trade and supply linkages. Um, and by revealing these, you know, economic systems and fragility uh, of lives and incomes across the world, particularly in the global south, the COVID-19 pandemic has made it clear that we really need to sketch out a new economy for the world. Beyond simply being a crisis, COVID-19 really offers us the opportunity to reshape economies that are both inclusive and impactful. So what we're looking at today is how can we really ensure that we are not wasting this opportunity by merely recovering old institutions of the previous economy rather than really creating a new resilient and inclusive economy. So as we kick off this series today, we really aim to understand the interplay and interrelationships between two key sets of stakeholders that are really imperative to restructuring this economy for impact. The first is the, the on-ground champions uh, who, who, are, who are doing work on ground with a lot of low-income communities. And the second is the financial community that's funding a lot of these efforts. For us, it's really imperative for these two forces to work in tandem so that we really can design a new architecture of this new financial system that will better serve the needs of society rather than society serving the needs only of the financial system. Um, so we're pleased to have with us some distinguished thought leaders and implementers on the panel in this discussion. So Margaret, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, Mr. Arun Myra helped us to curate this series and has really been a champion in supporting us uh, in this effort. He is a member of the Planning Commission Sumit Swani and is a former member of the Planning Commission of India and a former chairman of Boston Consulting Group. Mr. Lewis Miranda is the chairman of the Civil Center for Civil Society and Koro. Ms. Renana Jabala is an Indian social worker and chairperson of SIWA. Uh, and of course, Mr. Vinith Rai is the founder and chairman of the Avishkar Group. Um, Margaret, if you can go to the next slide, uh, just to provide some, some context on where we're going today. So I'm gonna hand this over to Mr. Myra just shortly. We'll have, Mr. Arun Myra will lead us through um, a, a discussion with, with the speakers who are, who are with us today. Then we'll definitely open it up for Q&A towards the end of the hour. Um, so please do include your comments uh, and questions in the chat box. We'll be happy to sort of answer them um, after, after the panel has, has uh, concluded. So please do uh, let us know your thoughts and comments. Um, and as you're joining us today, it would be great to hear where you all are joining in from um, and your organization. So thanks um, to those of you who have already done that. I see uh, Abhishek and Shafali and Ratsin, thank you so much. So, so welcome to everyone. Let us know where you're coming in from today. Um, and Mr. Myra, I will hand it over to you without uh, any further delay. Well, thank you very much. Um, am I unmuted? Yes, yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. Thank you for that excellent introduction. Uh, you really set it up very well. The context in which we are having this discussion, as well as what the discussion is going to be about. Um, creating an impact economy. And this word troubles me, this expression, creating an impact economy. It sort of implies 
that something is going to have a big impact. It's like a meteor which strikes the earth and has a big impact. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a big meteor. It's had a big impact on the economy. And what it has shown us is that the maximum impact has been on the poorest people, informal enterprises, people with fragile employment contracts. They've been the worst affected. Everybody's been affected. Big corporations have been affected. Their profits have collapsed. But who has come close to, if I would say, death and the margin of survival? It's not big people, wealthy people. The corporation might, but the big owners of the corporation themselves personally are not at that risk. So this is the world that has been exposed by COVID. And as you said very well, we cannot recover the world as it was because it is a very fragile world. In that world, there were people who were not being thought of even. And I would put it now this way, another uh, challenge going around the world is about uh, the rights of black people in the United States. And then we are realizing that we have to concern ourselves with the right of uh, people who have been suppressed for centuries in our own country. So just going back to, it's no fun in the US being a black man in a white man's world. And similarly, I must say in the economy, it's no fun being an informal enterprise in a world run by formal enterprises. In the, the big world, black people and the Dalits and others are told, learn to speak my language, to dress like me, in fact, whiten your skin, then I can do business with you. And formal enterprises which have the wealth and the power are expecting informal enterprises to become like them so that they could relate to the informal enterprises more comfortably. So in this world, this new world that we wish to shape, it's the connection between the small and the informal and the large and the formal that we have to reconstruct. We have got to redesign the economic system in which the small must find themselves able to stand on their feet more resiliently in the new economy. And the big must see their role in enabling now the small to stand on their own feet so that there's equality, if I might say, in voice and power amongst the big and the small to create a more just world. So between the small and the big, there's some connections are required to be made because presently the big have power in the world of finance, the big have power in the world of regulations. And it's the small who are suffering by too many regulations as being pointed out. Regulations which don't suit them, but the regulations are being imposed on them so that the big can read the small. We now can see who you are and relate to you and deliver to you conveniently from our side. Unless you become like what we want you to be, we can't deal with you easily. And the world of finance has a similar problem and it's very important today in the world that the uh, lack of resource, financial resource income of the small people as individuals and small enterprises must be addressed. And the new system must be one in which the big is nurturing the small and not sapping profits out of the small. So I put it all this question in a stark way because it will help to set up a very good discussion that I know we are going to have because of the three persons who are here in the panel with us. So just keeping this, I don't want them to take sides, but just to say that there's one side which is the side of the small who's not been heard of, heard from, sorry, enough in the economy that has had this shock. And then on the other side, there are people who had power and wealth. And Luis, uh, I, I, I know I'm, you are not a very wealthy person who thinks like wealthy persons, but you have helped to create the HDFC bank and you have, you know that side very well too. Of course, you're a polymath, you have created great social enterprises, the centers of think tanks and the New Indian Institute of Public Policy, which I have the privilege to uh, support you in. You know the world where power is and policies are made and where wealth operates. And beneath, my friend is, like me say, in the middle. 
His life has been for the last 20 years connecting these two worlds. So here we've got three wonderful people to have this discussion with that if we must, and we must shape the new economy and we will concentrate a lot on the flows of finance in this economy. But please, we will be bringing in these other matters about how decisions are taken about regulations and so on, such that they create a more resilient economy, more just to the small in, in the future. I'm going to begin by asking Renana uh, her perspective, because we must, I think, much more in this uh, new world when it's operating, and much more when we are creating this new world, listen to those who are the small, who represent the small and know the small very well. And no one more than you, Renana, as I mentioned uh, to us when we were having a preliminary discussion, I've been trying to research what must change in the way the economies, uh, our economy is constructed and looking for literature and insights and recent papers. And your name keeps coming up, Renana, about if one wants to understand the informal economy, why it works, it does work with very little resource and support. It's a very resilient economy, but is stigmatized. It's People feel that it should become formal, become large. Let's hear you. What is your perspective on how we will shape a better economy? Uh, thank you so much, Arun, for setting the context so well. And um, uh, uh, what you've mentioned is a very big question. What should the economy look like so that the small are heard? But uh, before I uh, actually try to uh, uh, um, deal with that question, I'd like to uh, go back to the COVID crisis. And as you rightly mentioned, it's affected the small much more than the big. And there were uh, two things I wanted to point out. First was that there has been a lot of attention given to what are called the MSMEs, the medium and small industry uh, enterprises. But a very, very large part of our economy is actually very, very small, what you could call micro or nano even enterprises, very small enterprises. Uh, and the figures I have from the NSS is that there are 6.3 crores such enterprises in the country, non-agricultural, um, and it employs nearly 12 crore people. So it's a very, very large economy. And uh, what has happened during the COVID crisis is these are uh, economies with turnovers, maybe you know, 12,000, 10,000, 12,000 rupees a month. But what has happened is those are, you know, they have small capital. And in the whole crisis, when everything was shut, and even now when work is not starting, they have had to use up the capital just to survive. And many of them now are, and these are people, say, in the rural areas, the weavers, um, those who do carpentry, those who do woodwork, um, in the urban areas, the street vendors, the small shop owners. So um, many of them are unable to start again. Um, and there really hasn't been any relief for them uh, at all, except one scheme, which is a 10,000 rupee loan for street vendors, which has just started. So we have to see how it works. So I just wanted to draw this picture of this very large number. And then on the other hand, in agriculture, you would see the small and marginal. Um, and fortunately, agriculture has not been so badly affected. But in general, uh, we know that the small and marginal are getting more and more squeezed. So uh, with that picture, the question is, what should the economy look like? Uh, now, there are a few things. One is that many of these small enterprises are connected to larger enterprises in some way. So there is definitely a, a link between, say, the very small home-based worker at home, a woman who is doing, say, embroidery for an international brand. That happens. And uh, there is a chain of people 
uh, who reach out to that small enterprise. So the question is that little enterprise is not recognized in this whole chain. So one of the important things that large enterprises can do for these very tiny ones is make sure that they're part of that chain. Um, finance, I mean, there's more than that. A lot of the government rules and regulations are actually against these small enterprises. Strange vendors, for example, the municipal regulations uh, are totally against them. So even though they're providing a service, they're removed as if they are criminals. And in fact, often the informal sector is treated like criminals. So to recognize the importance of these very small enterprises and to promote them rather than criminalize them. Um, I think finance, we really do need, to, finance doesn't come down to these small enterprises. Finance remains, uh, how many banks are giving loans to very small enterprises? Practically none. There is microcredit, and I must admit, I must say that uh, the whole growth of microcredit as well as the SEGs has supported very tiny enterprises. Um, but there are a lot of issues there. So the issue is that how can finance, how can the finance system nurture these small enterprises? Can we think of an economy of nurturance rather than an economy of exploitation? A nurturance that looks at these tiny enterprises as part of the local economy and nurtures the local economy. Um, and in finance, Everything is important, savings, credit, uh, micro insurance, um, and even investments. We can have very small micro investment, uh, sorry, very small um, methods, or we can have methods by which very small people can invest in the market and would be ready to invest in the market. So I think that's a very important point. How can finance nurture, uh, nurture the informal sector, nurture the small enterprises, and what are the kind of systems that we need for that? Thank you, thank you. Vineet, um, um, I have uh, been so inspired by you and been drawn to uh, stay close and keep learning with you, because the question that uh, Renana has posed, how can the financial system nurture uh, tiny enterprises and small enterprises has been your question. And you have learned a lot and you have been doing a lot to try and bring money from the big finance with this approach of nurturing. But it hasn't been easy because the big system has its own rules and its own requirements. Uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, what at this stage, now that you've had this COVID shock and there's a I think an understanding is we must step back at least for a few days and think about what a different system might look like. What would you say? Hmm? The system so, keeping in mind, we do need the big also for the time being forever also perhaps. Hmm? You know, I, I actually will not take a moral position <laughs> because sometimes it becomes very difficult to take a moral position. And uh, because I think uh, generally, I have met uh, very rich people and I have met very poor people and I find good people on both sides and evil people on both sides. So I generally assume uh, humanity both at, bo at all levels have similar kinds of people. So the what problem that we are discussing probably is how structures actually make sure that some are accepted and some are left out. And today morning, the the, the, the article that you wrote in I think business line uh, talked about uh, that you are sitting traveling in a bus and only when the brake was applied did people realize that there are lots of others who are clinging in different parts of the bus and who fell apart. So I think in that sense, uh, there are a lot of privileged people or rich people who do not realize uh, how many millions and billions of people are actually hanging on to a lot of good work that they have created. And that really is a challenge that I have myself dealt with all through. Uh, and I realized that uh, if you have to actually connect the twain, you have to learn both the languages because uh, we speak completely different languages. Uh, and those languages are not necessarily wrong or right. Those languages expect different things. And uh, uh, in my view, when we are uh, 
whether accidentally or by design, uh, Government of India has talked about the social stock exchange, where they are imagining that the markets will play a role for the for the deprived using the structures that are present. Now, one would say that what's so special about a social stock exchange? And I think uh, the path-breaking thought process behind this idea of social stock exchange is that A, it recognizes that there are a lot of not-for-profits and for-profits who are working to make an impact. Uh, and again, there is a question that was posed to me a couple of hours back, uh, but which organization says that it is not making impact? So are you telling me Reliance does not create jobs? Well, the answer is yes, Reliance creates jobs. Then is it not a social enterprise? Well, it is not a social enterprise as envisioned in the social stock exchange. And then when people say if both are making profits, how do you make a distinction between the two? And I think that's where uh, how you articulate yourself and to what extent you will go to hold yourself accountable for the claims you are making uh, to access a capital that has some level of uh, advantages uh, would make the social stock exchange relevant. Uh, the other way to look at it is what will capital see and why would it actually try to create a more equitable society? I think uh, one aspect of sustainable development goals, the work of which uh, 2018, we did a report called Better Business, Better World, where we predicted that India needs $650 billion every year for next 12 years for it to reach anywhere close to sustainable development goals implementation, which is imagining a world without hunger, without poverty, without inequity by 2030. Unfortunately, COVID has wiped out the last 20 years of work, so I don't think so 650 billion is any more relevant in that context. Uh, but there is a lot of people across the world, including all the governments, 193 governments of the world, who have signed up and agreed that they need to, they need to have a world of a certain kind by 2030. And that pressure is coming down to pension funds, insurance companies, and others who want to participate in this new articulation of impact and capital. And I think uh, if we are able to present ourselves as a regulated, transparent, impact-making uh, opportunity that India presents, uh, which represents the small, the marginal, the excluded, uh, and demonstrate it using financial jargons that they understand, I think you can rewrite uh, the language. We will have the instrument, we have the talent, and with the social stock exchange, we have the right concept or the jargon that the world will understand if we play it right. Thank you, thank you. Um, you said language, both sides need to um, learn each other's language to be able to uh, speak on, this, on the same level with each other. The point is also the same level with each other. Hmm? Sure. I just quite, uh, since uh, we've got Renana here and she works with the largest organization of women entrepreneurs perhaps in the world, I'm finding, you know, we're talking about the business must become, um, uh, there must be more diversity in business. And so we want to hire, the big business must hire uh, women. What we expect the women to do is to learn how to operate like a man better than a man. And even they begin to dress like men in big corporations. So we are trying to you know, change women into men and the same way we try to change the informal sector into the formal sector. Hmm? Rather than the other way around, I need to understand how well a woman, she is able to lead, she has a balanced scorecard in her mind. The compassion for the people in the family, Money should be available every day for the meals. Yeah, the kindness of the animals if the family has them as uh, milk animals and so on. There's a holistic, balanced way that a woman thinks about measuring her progress, which is quite different to the man who joins a corporation and then gets measured by a one set of indicators. So I like what you've introduced, and I'm going to just point that out as a question and don't necessarily answer it because I want to bring in uh, Luis and then yourself on the same subject. You said, what is a social enterprise? And you gave a very lovely example about reliance. And yes, reliance creates jobs. But with how much investment, how many jobs? Right? And since we are a capital scarce nation, each unit of capital must create many more jobs. And then you're being, for India's needs, a social enterprise and not by the few. Similarly, you can say, look, I've done so much of planting some forests here and there outside my factories. But if you say the stuff that you're producing and which you're selling is causing more harm to the soil, then the few trees that you've planted doesn't balance out, right? So the scorecard, and I've been following the debate about the social inter, inter, the stock exchange, it's coming to my mind to that, that we must have a scorecard. People must measure themselves against a balanced scorecard. 
and the society wants to know what is that, that scorecard that you're using to guide yourself and keep reporting your performance on all sides. Don't tell me the very little things you're doing on one side and glorifying them at the same time celebrating yourself for the great amount of wealth you created for yourself and for investors in your, in your company. So it's a social contract between the enterprise and society that the enterprise is delivering everything the society needs. The society does want the business enterprise to create profit even for NGOs invest in corporations. You do want their money to return uh, good returns for them, but they want much more than that, so all of us. Hmm? So there may be a solution here of defining a social enterprise as one that A, is measuring itself and is seen to be measuring itself and being accountable for a, a wider set of things. So I let Luis come in and Luis, I want to say this to you that I've enjoyed my time with the Indian School of Public Policy. And I found that these uh, capstone projects that the schools are running, three or four of them have approached me to be their guide and their subject has been this. How can we get the corporations to measure themselves on a balanced scorecard? And why is it they don't? Why is it they don't? And so the matter of pub public policy should the government impose a requirement on them to say, unless you measure yourself like this, you will not be allowed to raise money. So posing some big social questions here because we're talking about redesigning the economic system, aren't we? So Luis, what are your thoughts? Thank you, Arun. It's been a fascinating discussion so far. Uh, and, I, and, and I think it's important to, some rules of engagement have to be reinstated. Uh, and I'll come back to, uh, I studied at the University of Chicago, so I got a quote, Milton Friedman, starting away, who in the many, many years, decades back, talked about the role of the business to make profit. And he's been crucified on that, and capitalism has been crucified on that. But the whole, uh, but people forget to mention the rest of his statement, which is that, you know, the role of business is to make money, to make profits. And it's also at the same time to be done where there's proper competition whether with the companies follow the rules of the game and they do it without fraud or deception. So it's talk, it talks about the rules of the game. And if the rules of the game are set up, like you said, the balance scorecard, if that is defined to include also social good, then companies will follow because that's what the market does. It forces people to do what is right. Now, what was right was that you were to make money and they did make money. And I some of, some of the firm, the firm belief that economic development is the best way to reduce poverty in the world. We've seen that happen over the last 70 years. The way economic growth has happened and the amount of absolute poverty that has been reduced across the world in the last 30 years, let's ignore the last sort of uh, few uh, years because I think that's a blip, has been unprecedented. Now, uh, I also sort of, you know, look at this, it has become very fashionable to talk about inequality after Piketty came about. And I remember picking up a book at my daughter's college uh, bookstore, a book written by a guy called Harry Frankfurt, who was a professor at Princeton. Uh, is, the book was on inequality. And he said, uh, inequality is not morally objectionable. What is morally objectionable is the fact that there are so many people in absolute poverty like what Renana talked about, the street vendor, struggling to make a living. Uh, you know, uh, Vinit's worked so much on various social initiatives. I think we need to focus on that. It's very easy to fix inequality, tax the rich, but that doesn't make the poorer better. You've seen what happened for the first 40 odd years of our independence when we had socialism. We didn't really see, we saw a lot of people struggling and then things picked up after that. The number of people in absolute poverty went down from 60% to 40% over the last 30 years. So I think the economic, the fact that we've got to focus on rules on how do we increase the pie at the same time uh, help the people who are at the bottom of the pyramid and focus on uh, uh, improving their lives. So for example, and Vinit did refer to the social stock exchanges. And when I look at the report that they have, uh, a lot of these measures they talk about are things which actually are things which anyone talks about today. How do you reduce the opaqueness for a 12A, 12A, ATG approval or FCRA approval? Why do you have a cap on business income of 20% versus 50%? How can you make these organizations more sustainable? So therefore, if we focus more on 
you know, how can we, how can we improve the ease of doing charity? We talk about ease of doing business. What do we look at the ease of doing charity? How can we make that easy? Because I have the firm belief there is money available. Of course, recent events have uh, decimated a lot of their wealth. It'll come back. But if we make it easy to do charity or to help people, to help people at the micro enterprise, I chair an organization called the Center for Civil Society. With Renana, we've done a lot of work on how do we improve the lives of street vendors, for example. Street vendors is a classic case. A lot of my friends hate them because they, 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 they have, we have this battle between the right of a citizen to walk on a payment and the right of a poor person to make a living, a livelihood. And how can you create a framework which allows both people that right? Why, for example, does a street vendor sell uh, goods on the street, which is a small amount? Because when the cops come to chase them, they can grab and run. So things like that. So how can we improve that? I think we focused a lot on how do we improve the lives of the people living in absolute poverty, as opposed to talking about inequality on the other the other garbage, I think we'll have a lot of benefit. And the last point I want to say is uh, inequality of power is wrong. And that is something which has to be corrected. We've seen that happen. And at the same time also, it's not that if you're rich today, you have power infinitely. We've seen over time, uh, I remember about 10 odd years back, we looked at a list of who are the, the 10 richest families in India. And, you know, and that changes continuously because people who are rich fall away, people who are poor get up. So these are my initial comments on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I liked what you said from the University of Chicago and that uh, uh, business will do uh, what it's uh, required to do and therefore we must require business to yeah. you know, adopt a balanced scorecard. And you mentioned that, uh, well, economic growth is uh, good, is necessary. Yes, India has been growing faster than most other countries for the last 20 years on an average, except China. And yet, when you look at a balanced scorecard of India, which has been done by some agencies when I was in the planning commission, we have done the worst in terms of harm to the environment and non-inclusion of people. It's not just abject poverty. The people who fell off the bus weren't just a few. The people who fell off the bus are from, like Ranana's pointing out, over 70% of our population is those sorts of people. So a balanced scorecard for, we are using GDP as the measure of economic growth. So I come to again, the country scorecard, what should it have? What are the other things that we should be keeping our eyes on simultaneously while we are saying from $1 trillion to $2 trillion to $5 trillion economy. And in my analogy, be people with the power in the bus, the wealthy people and the economists guiding the policy makers, policy makers, had sort of two instruments only in the dashboard. One was the GDP kept pressing the accelerator to make that move. And the other was keeping an eye on the RPM, which is the stock market. It goes up and down and you don't want it to go too far out of the range. That's all. These other matters about harm to the environment and how people outside their lives were, were not included. So we have to think about, uh, and this Indian School of Public Policy could be a nucleus. We've been talking about creating a larger conversation what should be a good scorecard for India? Hmm? We, the people, want this to be our scorecard. So how do you create that conversation? This point, though, about uh, abject poverty and power, I want to bring it back to Renana. Renana, I think people who are at the bottom feel powerless in influencing their decisions. About, look, we are running small enterprises, but the regulations about our enterprises, no one asking us, the difficulty of our doing business, we asked Mr. Ambani and Mr. Tata what they should be changed in the government regulations to make it easy for them to do business. I'm being a bit provocative, Renana. What do you say? Well, <clears throat> thanks for asking that question because that's exactly what I wanted to uh, talk about. And to take up Louise's point, the rules of the game. So, um, Everybody needs to adhere to the rules of the game, but the rules of the game are quite different for large businesses as they are uh, as compared to those for very small businesses. And let me just take a few examples. Um, you mentioned street vendors. What are the rules of the game for them? The rules of the game is that you don't, you have no space in the city. 
So when the city is planned, when there's any kind of planning, the, there is no space planned for the street. Yes, the and therefore, sorry, uh, am I being, am I uh, audible? Yes, please carry on. Yeah. So uh, the rules of the game for the street vendor is that um, from starting from the planning stage to the legal stage, to the implementation stage, you have no space. Um, whereas the rules of the game could easily have been that let us plan for a, a certain number, a certain percentage of street vendors in our markets, uh, in our cities. That would have been a positive rule of the game. Similarly, very small enterprises operate from their homes, especially women's enterprises. But cities have this residential, commercial, residential areas and commercial areas. So those little enterprises which are operating from their homes are often treated as illegal. Um, in rural areas, there are many government schemes for large farmers, but, on, but actually most of the uh, farmers are small and marginal. And um, interestingly, many of them are women although they are not actually listed as farmers. And uh, because they're women and because they're not listed as farmers, they cannot get access to the seeds, to the fertilizers uh, and the pesticides that are provided. So the rules of the game are not in favor of the small enterprises. And what we need to do is change the rules of the game. Um, I don't say that we uh, you know, change the rules of the game from the large enterprises. I don't know enough about that, but I, we can sector by sector, um, enterprise by enterprise, actually point out which are the rules of the game uh, which need to be changed so that ease of doing business is there for the small enterprises. And let's talk about finance. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not as if these enterprises are in not in the market. But you know, there are layered markets. The markets that these enterprises access are sort of the most exploitative. The interest rates are the highest, 5% per month often. Um, the uh, prices at which they buy their raw materials are the highest because they can't buy on very large wholesale amounts. The markets where they sell are the lowest because they have to sell immediately, they can't, um, they can't, they can't uh, um, keep their product till the market is better off. So they are in the markets, but these markets are the most exploitative markets. Can we think of them entering the better markets, lower interest rates, um, higher, uh, lower, raw material prices. So I think that's, those are the two things, the rules of the game, and let us look at the markets and which are the markets that they inhabit, can those markets be upgraded for them? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm going to, Vanita, not let you just pause for a while and ask Urvashi, let's see what questions there are. I, I'm watching the chat and many people are making suggestions and giving examples. By this stage, let's get questions. Questions to which we don't have answers, perhaps, but need to find answers. Okay, um, so let's see what questions you've got. Good questions to our panel. Thank you. Uh, actually, we have a really interesting question from Devika Mahadevan from Mandeshi. And I'm gonna ask her to just turn her mic on and ask the question, if you can. Hi, uh, thanks Urvashi. This is for Renana. Renana, um, I also work with Mandeshi, which of course is dealing with many of the issues that you're talking about. But I just wanted to ask the question, like, um, you know, recently a three, a three lakh crore uh, MSME uh, loans, I mean, a whole package of loans have been offered by the government, of which about 50,000 crores is debt finance for MSMEs. And of course, 10% of these MSMEs are women owned uh, businesses but uh, there's this huge financing gap right now and 90 percent of 90 over 90 percent of uh, women owned businesses are the micro and the nano enterprises that you're talking about 
but they are unable to access finance beyond microcredit. So I'm really talking about uh, growth finance for their enterprises. So what do you suggest that we can do or um, what are the kind of gaps that have to be addressed like you're going enterprise by enterprise for this enterprise growth finance to reach women, nano and micro entrepreneurs? Uh, Renana, please you answer and I'd like Vineet to follow you on this because it's a subject that he also yes. knows. Renana. Sure. Um, I was just reading in the papers that uh, of that 50,000 crores, about 43% has been accessed. Um, but the question, of course, is these would be really uh, not the micro enterprises we are talking about. They are the small enterprises or the medium enterprises, the factories, and of course, most are owned by men. Uh, what we're thinking of is not only the women, but overall, how do you reach finance to the smallest uh, enterprises, to those who run very, very tiny businesses? The women, if we talk about the women, then the women home-based workers, those who make things in their home, the women livelihood producers. And um, the three methods that are happening now are, uh, of course, microcredit, then there are the self-help groups, and we have to say that those things do exist and have been somewhat successful. Um, and then there are organizations like your bank or our silver bank, uh, which is a bank whose aim is to actually reach uh, the smallest enterprises and who have developed systems on reaching the smallest enterprises. And I think all these three methods have shown that women small enterprises are excellent investments and that their, um, their repayment rates are much higher than those of the bigger enterprises. Um, I would really like to propose that there will be many, many more banks like ours uh, in the country, which are designed in order to reach these small enterprises. And uh, I you know, obviously don't have the time to go into the design now, but the design exists and can be replicated. Thank you. Uh, th this is the question that you has been asked uh, is, brings us to the heart of what we said we will be discussing, which is about uh, on the financial side, uh, getting a more level playing field with easier flows uh, for the small enterprises. So Vineet and Luis, if you have any thoughts on this, because the three of you were for this question. First you Vineet. Yes, yeah, so I, I think uh, Renana actually answered the question very simply. The design exists, just need to replicate at scale. So either the institutions that are there, they need to scale. But if that's not a good idea, then there may be 100 such institutions which are doing it. Because the design, the productivity, and, uh, and how you reach there, and what kind of returns they can generate is already known. So I'll stop there. I have a couple of examples to give to state my point that... Uh, we need to, while rules and regulations are important to change, I think there is a need for innovation. Uh, and innovations of two kinds, I'll actually very quickly illustrate two, uh, two questions. I was part of the Prime Minister's group for doubling farmers' income. And uh, as part of Avishkar's own desire to make that impact, we basically invested in a small company in Samastipur in Bihar, which was essentially creating a warehouse, farmer's warehouse, or a grain bank right in the village. Now, it's a completely... Uh, if you look at India's warehousing policy, it has already been designed for large traders, brokers to actually buy and store produce so that they can sell it at a very high price or a very reasonable margin. High price is actually probably a fraud per process because commodities don't have much margin. But what they do is they buy the farm, buy from the farmer when they have just harvested because the farmer doesn't have much harvesting space and also needs finance immediately. And therefore, the traders and middlemen actually buy it and then create a supply chain which is reasonably efficient for the large institutions. And the warehousing is actually designed for the brokers and not for the farmers. This guy, the entrepreneurs came to us to actually design a warehousing scheme, which will become a bank, effectively behave like a bank uh, using technology and uh, a very efficient financing mechanism. So that a 200 tons uh, warehouse in a village or 500 ton warehouse in village can become viable. Uh, five years down the line, uh, this is now, this company now, is actually having 70, 70 odd warehouses with an average size of 500 tons. You can say that they have gone up to 50,000, 70,000, 80,000 tons of uh, 
uh, warehousing. The interesting part is they are able to because they, so what they do is the farmer comes comes with a single bag, so you can be the smallest farmer come with a bag. You can store your bag. The bag is digitized. You are actually given a certificate. Uh, you receive a on on you get a a, a, a sort of a check uh, a, almost like a banking passbook on your phone where you can see your storage. It is digitized and then. The farmer is receives a loan, seventy percent of the price of the stored product, and can go away and also sell this produce at the price because they use the digitized grain bank to find a price over next five six months, which is between one point four to one point eight times of what the farmer would have got. Now, to me, this is actually a classical innovation which effectively takes a farmer in a commodity like wheat and maize uh, and paddy. Income by 1.4 to 1.7, and I have five years of track record of continuously monitoring uh, what they have been doing. 1.4 to 1.7 consistently, of course, in one year, well, maize went very high, so they got 1.9 to 2.1 also. But generally, you can do a something similar innovation, and we took it to the government, and the government has been very kind, and the Secretary, agriculture secretary, government of India, got so excited that they have now actually allowed this company. To talk to all the government warehouses and help them to run it in this efficient way. So, just an idea, a small innovation in Bihar, in Samastipur, and anybody who has been to Samastipur would know it is really back and beyond. Uh, can actually transition and increase farmers' income by a significant number. Thank the you. second thing that, yeah, the other example that I would like to give is if the social stock exchange comes through, or even if it doesn't come through, uh, the alternate investment funds under SEBI has a has a small. Uh, there is a there is a mention of a social venture fund, which is a very effective tool to create bonds, impact bonds, etc., at a fairly reasonable and uh, small price to address some of the issues that have been raised. So, for example, if uh, the migrants who have walked back to Bihar, Jharkhand, UP, Orissa want to, who have some skills and want to start a business, like for example, we just read about uh, in Bihar, guys who have walked back from Kashmir have started a, a cricket bat manufacturing unit. But they don't have the money, so they are actually looking for money. Let's assume for a minute, we say we will create 10,000 jobs for those migrants who have come back and don't want to leave, and go and raise a register a social venture fund, and then raise money like Avishka raises money. Somebody goes and raises money for giving a loan, and you go and tell. So I come to Luis or Mr. Myra and say, can you participate in this fund? And your money will be protected. We will lend the money at six, seven, eight percent. We will not make any money, but you will get back your principal back. You will not earn anything. So that actually could be one instrument. You can also say, I can give you two percent return. You can also say you might lose ten percent of your money, but ninety percent will come back. Uh, there is a third kind, third example, and this is our HDFC is actually there is a mutual fund which is on the which actually asks you to invest in the mutual fund, and you can then decide to donate the returns that have been generated by the mutual fund. To any foundation or any charity of your choice. In this case, it is a cancer society, but you can actually do it. So that's like that kind of mutual funds can also be raised where you invest in uh, corporates like Reliance, make money and donate your money away so that uh, somebody can be benefited, some society, some not for profit, etc., can be benefited. I think innovation is a very important tool. The regulation is going to follow innovation, it will not lead innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Luis. I, I know you should say something on this matter, and you should now. I'd like time for one more question. So, Luis, after you, it's brief. Uh, Urvashi, keep ready. The next very sharp, good question, like the one we've already been asked. Luis. Yeah, uh, thank you, Arun. I quickly want to say, you know, I, I agree. You know, Bidhi talked about innovation, and Rihanna talked about the, the need to help give money to the poor, and I totally agree with it. I used to be on the board of, an, of a small finance bank, and I've sort of seen it firsthand. And I've also invested in a company which gave small loans. That company shut down because of the challenges. Two things I want to talk about. One is the ease of giving credit. Uh, if, for example, the Aadhaar card was something, why do, why do people have struggled giving loans to small people? It's because of uh, the lack of information, credit information. The Aadhaar card was a brilliant way to be able to, the other number, a brilliant way to give credit to people, poor people. It creates a credit bureau, it gives information, and therefore good borrowers will have access to cheaper funding. Unfortunately, privacy, uh, guys who've wanted, focused on privacy, 
basically hurt the poor by scrapping that rule. The second is loan waivers. That creates bad behavior with, uh, with, uh, with borrowers and creates perverse incentives. So if we were to just fix these two, we'd see actually a lot more credit going to poorer people. Luis, uh, before I ask the next question, just an observation that loan waivers, this has been the challenge in the power whole equation in the economy, that the loans of the bigger companies in the US and even now pressure to let them go because unless we save the big, how will the poor survive? So when the farmer's loans are forgiven, uh, people say India is becoming socialist. When the big people's loans are forgiven, oh, we are being a good red-blooded capitalist economy. Um, so yes, I think we must change our views on uh, um, um, the power between the small and the big and have fair rules for both. The same rules. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Same rules for both. Yeah. So one more question, please, Urvashi. Uh, we have a really good question with regards to technology as an enabler and I would ask Venkat to please ask that question. <clears throat> Hi, Arun. Hi. Um, it's great to be on uh, to hear this uh, conversation uh, one of the part uh, when we started this whole dialogue was how can we reimagine the economy for creating more impact one question which has been there is definitely about climate change and sustainability a lot of these uh, uh, ips are coming into the public domain can we get some thoughts as to how we can create incentives for both the ip creators as well as to people to scale this so that it can reach the market because technology has been a great creator of wealth in the market economy. Um, Vineet, would you like to answer this? We have just three or four minutes. So if anyone amongst you am asking, Luis, um, Vineet, um, Rinana, anyone feels I'm ready to give you a good answer in three minutes? Yeah, well, I, I can only say, and this is, <laughs> Uh, Venkat, uh, you know my view, so I didn't want to actually add too much, but just from a general, journalistic public, technology is going to be the real disruptor in case we have to take capital uh, or uh, wealth. Or I call it, how do you make poor people rich? Uh, if you have to do that, you have to use technology because it's a great leveler. Uh, I think intellectual property is really about sharing your knowledge with the society. It's again a contract between the individual innovator and the society so that you disclose to the society what you know, and in return, you get exclusivity for, let's say, seven years or 14 years, or whatever the time frame. Uh, I think the investing, uh, when you come up with an idea, which actually requires a significant amount of... Hello? Um, we lost Vineet. Urvashi, can you hear me? I can hear you. And very new uh, in DST and DSIR, which are, which are quite supportive. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, a little more can be done, but uh, I think uh, technology-based innovation or tech-based innovations, uh, not just the software part of it. The hardware uh, is important. Uh, same thing in agriculture. There are lots of innovation taking place. And with the incubator economy that is coming up in India across the board, I am hopeful that more success will come through. Thank you. I, I, as I'm uh, going to uh, um, um, say something, but before that, Urvashi, it would be very nice if you can see the faces of our panelists. We are seeing at the moment this white thing which has questions. Um, can you just get the faces back? Oh. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. But yeah. So to this point about intellectual property, I noticed, Venkat, your question too. The matter comes again about ownership. And the, the inequalities in the world today are very largely because some people own the intellectual property. The differences in wealth are very much associated with who owns the knowledge. And we've designed intellectual property, we've de described intellectual property as property, which a person can own, and then that person can reap the benefits of it by charging other people prices for using it. And so we have to rethink this. These are the, the rules in the economy. We are, going to be living in a knowledge economy more and more. And therefore the rules of who owns knowledge and how people can have access to knowledge freely is going to determine, frankly, inequity or inequalities and the change of power in, in society. So there's some rethinking on that. Innovation necessary, but who is getting the benefit of owning the innovation is the question. Hmm? 
So to the same question, innovation, Luis, would you have? Because you are the public policy man. Any thoughts? <laughs> well, no, I, I agree with the banker that you know the uh, you you need to sort of create right incentives for people. So I mean, you look for example at a lot of the wealth that has been created by the fang companies, Facebook, Amazon, etc. A lot of them use technology that was developed actually in the public domain, and then they were able to leverage up that. So, 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 you, so, you, so you have that situation where you can create public sort of goods out over there, and people can be innovative in creating wealth uh, around that. And, and I, I mean, I, I know I, I could be slaughtered by some people, but I think Amazon has created huge markets for a lot of small enterprises, which otherwise they may not have been able to access. Or, uh, you know, Facebook has been able to create, connect people like, the, you know, people have not been able to do before. Yes, there's always a trade-off, but they created those platforms. Mm -hmm. okay. And they created wealth for the people behind it. Right. So we are going to have to conclude this. And uh, my job is to say that we've got very good questions, like including this question about uh, the relationship between innovation and intellectual property. Very good questions about uh, how... Uh, the smaller people could themselves be playing a much larger role in framing the rules of the game, including perhaps of intellectual property and ownership and designs of enterprises. We've talked really what is the purpose of economic growth of growth. It is to create a more fair economy in which those who presently, because of history, are not feeling sufficiently included in the decision-making process, not merely in the economic benefits, are feeling that this is an unjust economy. And because it was being run unjustly, when the bus stopped, the consequences of injustice and the bad design of the economy were visible to all of us. The people who were harmed the most, the impact of the COVID meteoroid harmed the people who weren't sufficiently included in the design of the economy and the rules of the game uh, so far. So that's my uh, 30 second summary. We are going to be, uh, having a couple more conversations and Urvashi and uh, Abhishek and myself and Vineet, we're going to sit and think, what is the next conversation going to be about and who should we have in that conversation? Because we want to explore these questions more deeply. The answer will not come to redesign the global economy in this beautiful one hour that we've had and nor will it come in a year. It is going to require deep conversations between many people taking question to question deeply and then putting a design together, at least an idea of a design together. And in Sankalp in uh, November, uh, this is our ambition, my ambition with Baneet and uh, Urvashi, we would hopefully be able to share, and this is where we need your help, Luis and Rinana, a vision of, uh, an idea of an economy, sort of the rules of the game of that economy, the shape of that economy, what we would be paying attention to that economy. Let's put that out as like a straw man and let's have many discussions around that. We can then create an Indian view of what the economy should look like no later than November. Hmm? Time is running out. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Renana. Thank you, Vineet. And thank you, Luis. And thank you, Rushi. Thank, thank you, thank Arun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arun. That was really interesting. I hope uh, you're really ambitious about creating a new view of the economy, but unless one is, one doesn't get anywhere. Yes, yes, yes. So thanks, Urvashi, back to you. You can close and yes, pat us on the back and before we go. <laughs> Thank you very much for that very, very enriching uh, conversation. Uh, I think we, you know, we've had a number of people from not just from India, but from across the world join this conversation. It's also been shared on Facebook Live, and we will also sort of be carrying on this conversation beyond this. Uh, but thank you. As always, it's been incredibly inspiring to spend this one hour with you all. And uh, I thank all the panelists also. Uh, Renena, Lewis, Vineet, thank you for sharing your views on this. And we look forward to, uh, and thank you to all the participants also for joining this conversation. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on subsequent uh, sessions. And at Sankalp in November also, of course. Mm -hmm.